Hello everyone, good evening, a very warm welcome, quite literally, although actually it is always lovely and, and cool inside the conduit. Um, my name's Hannah McInnes, I'm delighted to welcome you all here this evening on behalf of two of my most um, revered institutions, the Conduit and the How To Academy. Uh, and it is, I hope you've come here with um, clear minds because you have a lot to get your heads around. Uh, I know this from having spent the past week with the book that has inspired the event this evening. Uh, I'm sure many of you have your copy uh, in store, The Handover, How We Gave Control of Our Lives to Corporations, States and AIs, and also knowing uh, the guests that we have with us this evening too. Uh, it is a profoundly thought-provoking, uh, compelling read. You want to discuss it with everyone that you then come across. So I feel very grateful that the person I've come across this evening is the mind from where it came from, because there is a lot uh, to ask of him. Uh, he is, of course, Professor of Politics at Cambridge University, um, the author of a number of other books. I'm sure uh, that you have um, read many of them, or most of them, How Democracy Ends, uh, Where Power Stops Being But Two. Um, so, David, thank you very much for writing this, and thank you very much for coming to uh, explain it to us. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for coming to ask some questions. Well, I'm, I'm going to start um, with a quote from, from do, you. By the way, do we need these? Or, yeah. so, yes. All right. Okay. Uh, and of course I should say that I have my time for questions and um, the conduit members' questions are always absolutely brilliant, so there will be time for yours as two, or two afterwards. So perhaps one of the most prevalent worries or talking points of our age is what's going to happen with robots, with AI. And you say, for all the apparent novelty of our current situation, self-driving cars, machine-made love poems, the sex bots are coming you know, exclamation mark for kind of help. We have lived this story before. So I think a lot of people will think, really? How, how have we lived this before? So I should say we haven't lived the sex bots story before. <laughs> that is still to come, I think. Uh, so the, the starting point for me for this book was the thought that this very 21st century worry, which is we have started, and maybe for a while now, have been building machines that we are giving human-like qualities to, including the ability to take decisions for us, possibly, though not yet, what we would call the ability to think. They're not I yet, I think, thinking machines. But they have these superhuman powers. They can do things much quicker than us. They can answer questions that we have no idea how to answer. And we're building them because they're meant to make our lives go better. And in many ways, they already have started to make our lives go better. They can give us incredible efficiencies that we wouldn't get any other way. They're always being touted. They might solve problems that we can't work out how to solve. Maybe this technology, this AI technology, will give us health systems that work, transport systems that work. Maybe climate change needs a kind of AI application. So there's great hopes for this technology. And there's also a fear that it might be a disaster. And the disaster would be that we might be building machines that we lose control over that we, we, we build them, but we're not actually that sure how they work, and they start taking decisions, and we think, we don't know, even the people who built them, we don't know how they arrived at that decision. And then, because they're not human, so we make them humanoid, but they're not human, they might not care about us. They might be indifferent to our fate. They don't have a conscience, they don't have a soul, they don't have a heart. And I think that set of hopes and fears and worries is one we've actually been living with for centuries, because we've already done this. Starting, I say in this book, more than 300 years ago, but accelerating through the 20th century, we have been building artificial, human-like, decision-making machines. Their name is states and corporations. States and corporations which, into which we input information, data, votes, choices, out of which come decisions, have superhuman powers, they are not human, they are artificial, they don't live and die in the way that we do, they don't feel things. You try and get a corporation to feel something, it's not going to happen. So they're not feeling creatures, they're not thinking creatures. What they are is artificial decision-making machines. And their superhuman powers have built the world that we live in. So they have actually made our world safer, more convenient, they've made us more prosperous, they've made us healthier. The history of the modern world is the history of how state and corporate power has carried burdens and responsibilities over time. Welfare states, peaceable relations between states, 
economic prosperity has been driven by corporate power because corporations can do things that other organizations can't. And they have the power to kill us all. And if the world ends, it won't be because the killer robots or the sex robots eat us. It will be because states and corporations destroy us because they are conscienceless, heartless, soulless machines. And they are, as we speak, chewing through the resources of the planet, and they are armed up to the teeth, and they are fighting wars. So this book is about what that story suggests about the one to come. And there are various implications of this argument, but there's the central idea in it and where I started was, what if we have lived this story once before? What if that ship has already sailed? We've already built the machines that are like us but aren't actually human, that do things for us that we can't do for ourselves, on which we rely, to which we have franchised that decision making, out of which we come to achieve prosperity and peace, and which may not care about us and may in the long run finish us. So there are lots of things about what you've just said to discuss and to question uh, in terms of how you came to those conclusions. But I am still interested, you say that you've been thinking about this for a long time, and I just, in terms of where it came from, did something prompt this thought that we are in, this is a handover rather than a new fear? What, what was it that got you interested in that? So, so, so there are a couple of things. So one of which, it, it's just the starting point of the book, and it's not, it doesn't then dominate the book at all, but it, it's striking just because it's so long ago. The work of political philosophy that I've been thinking about most of my professional life and shapes a lot of the ways I think our world is organized without us being aware of it, which is Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, which has a reputation for being a very bleak book. It's about the creation of the modern state, this, this entity that dominates our lives. The very first line of that book says, the state is an automaton, which is another word for a robot. It's not strictly the same, but it's close enough. So let's say, had he been writing now, he might have said the state is a robot. It is an artificial human being built to be an artificial decision-making machine. It's a machine, it's a robot, it's humanoid, it's like us. And this was written in 1651. So that is a long time ago for someone to be thinking about the coming of the killer robots. And Hobbes says of this robot, it will save us because it has qualities we lack. So we can't stabilize our world because of our human frailties. We're too fickle, we're too emotional. We live, we die, we get old, we get sick, we go mad. We sleep. We sleep. So if you put your politics in the hands of humans, doesn't matter whether it's kings or queens or emperors or parliaments or the people as a whole, they will have all of these human frailties. You might be lucky, you might get a good one, you might get a bad one. But in the long run, human frailty will win out. But if you build a mechanical version of a human being, you can have some of the things that you need, stability, reliability, durability, very hard to kill, because if you build a machine well, it just keeps going. So you can have all of that, which will free us up to be human. So Hobbes thought, in a world of endless conflict and violence, it's really hard to live a flourishing human life, because our human qualities lead us to fight each other all the time. But say we could sort of dump all of that onto the big robot machine that takes decisions for us, that would leave us free to lead these up and down, crazy, emotional, romantic, loving lives, all the stuff that makes us human, with some security that it won't lead to disaster because the machine will kind of carry the weight of the really hard stuff. But as people have pointed out from that day to this, it's a trade-off because the downside of building that machine is it can kill us. It's a giant, scary robot. It's the state. And it might take a decision like to go to war, armed to the teeth with weapons, believing that its life is the most important life. The state has to defend itself. And human beings could be sacrificed in their millions along the way. That's the great sort of puzzle at the heart of modernity. The thing that makes us safe is the thing that threatens us. And Hobbes says, it's a robot. I think many people will, will be wanting to ask you, if states and corporations are made up of humans, don't they essentially maintain their humanity? They're made composed of humans, assembled I mean, of humans. If we do the analogies here, Google, I mean, by Google, I mean the search engine. Google is made up of humans, right? I mean, it's actually also increasingly now made up of bots inputting questions as though they were humans. But it's, 
It's us that give it its capacity to act. We feed in the questions. We are the source of its data. All of these algorithms are feeding off humans. It's not like they are these machines that don't connect to us. We are what empowers them. We are what gives them the ability to act. But what they do is they take us, our inputs, and Hobbes thought this state would take the inputs of human beings, citizens, subjects, as he called them, take an aspect of our humanity and turn it into something. And in his case, he thought it would turn it into an authoritative, authoritative decision that everybody would have to abide by. So that image is of a machine build up of human beings. But I think it would be a mistake, you know, if you think about, I mean, calling them robots is probably a misnomer because when we talk about AIs, we're not on the whole thinking about robots. We're thinking about algorithms and algorithms don't have to be embodied in that way. But we're thinking about devices that take inputs and turn them into outputs. The inputs may well be human, but you feed them through the machine, and what comes out will not be human. It will have been transformed by having been processed by this machine. That is what happens in modern states. Modern states are these vast machines. Human beings feed into them and outcome decisions. And they may be the decisions of one person. You know, Putin decides on behalf of the Russian state. But it's still the Russian state that has to do it. We talk as though Putin invaded Ukraine. He didn't. Putin took a decision. It was fed into the Russian state. And out of that comes 100,000 deaths. Not people killed by Vladimir Putin, but people killed by the Russian and Ukrainian state. And that is analogous, I think, to what happens with the whole range of artificial decision-making machines from a Leviathan from 1650s through to ChatGPT today. What is ChatGPT? It's just hoovering us up, hoovering up vast databases of human language and predicting what we will find plausible as a response. It doesn't, it doesn't exist without humans, but it would be a mistake to think that its response is a human response. It takes us and turns us into something that is artificial. So when you are pointing this out, noticing this, sort of writing this, who's it for? Do you feel in being aware of this, we can do something to stop it? Do we need to? Um, I, I, so I, I think a few things about that. So first, I don't think I'm writing a book that's going to sort of change uh, any of this. It's, it's, uh, uh, I'm partly writing this book because I think there's a really interesting story here. And I just think that the... Analog analogies are thought-provoking, and sometimes the book, that's the best you can hope for. And it's not, um, I know, I mean, my publisher is here, and publishers, I'm not saying this of my publisher, but publishers uh, with books like this often say, okay, so where's the answer, the solution? You know, there has to be a chapter at the end which says this is what we can do. And I always think it'd be really odd if you knew what to do to think the way to communicate it would be in a book like this. I have no idea what we should do. <laughs> But I think we could think about some of this differently. And I think we could start recognizing that some of our contemporary anxieties maybe misjudge the nature of the threat. Because I think one of the things that we're currently obsessed with is the thought that what is coming is a contest or a zero-sum game of some kind between the human and the AI. Are they going to take our jobs? You know, are, they, are they going to replace us? And you know, Are the sex bots going to replace human lovers? Are they going to become smarter than us? Will artificial intelligence outdo human intelligence? Will they acquire consciousness like our consciousness? So it's a sort of human to AI question. And I think it misses out the most important players in the fate of all of us, which are the other robots, the other machines. Because actually, we don't control what will happen in the space of AI, what our collective fate is as these smarter machines come online. States and corporations will decide that. So the decision about these machines is being made by machines that aren't the same as them. And one of the points I make in the book is that states and corporations, the British state, even something like DeepMind, in theory, smartest people in the world are working at an organization like DeepMind. But DeepMind itself, like any corporation, any corporate entity, is not super intelligent. It is a decision-making machine. And there's no way that, for instance, the British state is smarter than the smartest people in Britain. The cleverest people in Britain are cleverer than the British state. 
But the British state has capacities that no human being in Britain has. It has the ability, and I say in the book, I think there are two primary things that states do that we can't do. They can sustain all sorts of projects over the long run, and above all, the ability to borrow money and pay it back over centuries. That's where the power of states come from. It is their credit, their credit worthiness. And human beings just get written off. If you try and borrow the amount of money that the US state has borrowed, you will, <laughs> oh, you yes. will go bust. Can you please explain how much and the timing of I how much it goes up? Because it's, <laughs> it's, mean, it's a number with so many zeros in it. But if you divide it. it, I do remember if you divide it by the number of people in the United States, every single American man, woman, child owes $100,000 which means that most Americans are technically bust. But they don't owe the money, the state owes the money. So states can borrow and states can sustain wars. States have the ability to fight wars on a scale that no other human organization has ever been able to do. So they're not super intelligent, these things, but they do have, I call it super agency in this book. They have powers that go beyond the human. And it includes the power to decide about things like the regulation of AI. And it would be a mistake to think that what's coming is the human versus the artificial. And we've got to sort of reassert our humanity in the face of the looming sex spot revolution. Because if we want to assert our looming humanity in the face of the, our humanity in the face of the sex spot revolution, either states or corporations are going to have to decide on our behalf to stop this. We can't do it. And so that means, at the very least, this is a three-way relationship, human, artificial decision-making machine, artificial intelligence machine. And I think one of the mistakes we make is to spend too much time ignoring the artificial decision-making machines or just assume they are a proxy for the human. And they're not. And at, you know, just to give one example, at the most basic level, when we're thinking about the AIs, we might think we need to, you know, if we want to get back control over them, we need to you know, redesign them, re-engineer them, re-manage them. You know, these are machines, so if we want them to work better, we have to design them to work better. Same is true of states and corporations. We probably need in a world of coming AI to make these things work differently and better. They are mechanical devices, but we never do that. We just let them run. You know, the British state has been running on the same machinery for about 100 years, which is very weird in a world where all other forms of machinery have changed. The basic machinery of the British state is still the same. I mean, it's still, the American state still has the electoral college. Now, the Electoral College is part of the algorithmic machinery of the American state. How does Donald Trump become president of the United States? Because America has an Electoral College, which is the means by which the inputs of the voters get turned into a decision. Yeah, Hillary Clinton got more votes, but Donald Trump is president of the United States. Why does America have an Electoral College? I don't know. It's like 200 years of history. Now, it seems odd in a world where you need to really keep up that you would run 200-year-old machinery in order to try and decide who should take the decisions about the biggest threats that we face. So thinking about those other things, not as an extension or a proxy for the human, but as their own kind of machinery, seems to me really important. And one of the ways in which I think we maybe get the direction of travel here wrong. I might have to read the bit about the... the with the debt. You said, as I write this, the American national debt stands at more than $30 trillion, so many noughts, I can't imagine. I've written wow. And it's impossible to be more precise because the figure on the debt clock rises by around 10,000 per second. That's nearly one million in the time it's taken me to compose these two sentences. <laughs> Stare at it too long and you start to lose your mind. Whichever way you look at it, it's a staggering sum of money. And, but one of the things that you do talk about is you, you say if we try and humanize states we diminish them or we try and make we try and bring in politicians with characters and i think you say look where that gets us or something to that to that end but then you do make suggestions of ways that you can humanize states with sort of, um, um, citizens assembly type things yeah so I, I think um i mean i think we should try and humanize states i don't want to say that i'm the person who thinks you know let's just embrace the fact that everything is now artificial and mechanical and I think we want machines that are as close as possible aligned with what human beings want, because otherwise we do lose control. If we're living in a world where the, the most powerful machines don't actually understand what human beings want, and that's sometimes true of states and corporations. I mean, for instance, it may be that human beings want to live in a sustainable environment, 
and states and corporations are relatively indifferent to that. I mean, it's possible, because otherwise, how do you explain what's going on in the world? So we want to get them more aligned with us, our values, and our understanding of the world. But the way that we tend to think about that is, if we could just replace that person with that person at the top of these states, you know, if we could just get rid of him and replace him, usually with a him, but sometimes with a her, we obsess with, we, we get obsessed with the swapping out of the, the figureheads of these states. Whereas actually, I think there are much more radical ways in which we could try and generate more human input. After all, most of us, I'm sure most of us feel this, we don't often get asked by our states what decisions we would like. We get asked every few years who we want to be the figurehead. But the idea that these states would have more input from us is still pretty remote. But there are lots of ways it could happen, not least this technology makes it possible. There was a dream 20 years ago, it feels, or maybe the 1990s, longer, you know, that this technology was going to empower citizens because finally these damn states would have to listen to us because the machinery was now available for us to input directly into their decision making. Has it happened? We had one referendum. Well, we had more than one, but we won't have another one for a while, not on that question. <laughs> Because we, we sort of try these old-fashioned, really badly calibrated, you know, badly designed decision-making mechanisms, and then we get put <laughs> off. There are a million ways we could do it. There could be more direct democracy, participative democracy, citizen assembly-style democracy, more consultation. We can involve all sorts of citizens in all sorts of different ways. I think children should be involved. I think children should vote. I think all sorts of things could happen, but we don't do that. While the people building the AIs are changing what they do every day, we just plow on with the old machinery. So it's not that I'm against humanizing the state, but I'm against thinking that if we could just replace Rishi Sunak with Keir Starmer, suddenly an inhuman state would become a human state, because I don't think that's going to happen. But what about corporations then? Because we haven't talked about them as mm. much. I mean, states, you say, are very difficult to kill off. They are. And corporations come and go yeah. more quickly. Yeah. They also would seem to us or seem to me to be run by humans. Yeah. I mean, some of them do seem quite robotic, but they are humans so, at the top of them. Yeah, so they, they are run by humans. And one of the ways in which these machines can make decisions is we can franchise out the decision to the machine, and then the machine can decide to let this committee, that executive, this person in this role take the decision. So there are, there are chains of decision making in this, but it does pass through these machines because corporations, when those decisions are taken, they have a weight and a, a durability that wouldn't happen in any other way. There, it's not an accident that the, the modern economic world is organized around the corporate form because corporations are designed including limited liability corporations, which was the, you know, the origin of this world we live in, build these artificial things, load debt onto them, and make the people who are the investors in those things not liable to go bankrupt. So the, the machine, the corporation, takes on the debt, pays back the debt, has its own bank account, employs the people, sues people, can be sued by people. It starts to do all these human-like things, but it's not human. The difference, as you say, between states and corporations, the easiest way to sum it up is that the number of states in the world is weirdly fixed in that, I don't know the exact numbers, but it was roughly 250 years ago and it's roughly 200 now. States, stable, reliable states, states that can function in the modern world, are really hard to create and really hard to destroy. It takes a lot of work to make a state and it takes a lot of work to kill a state. And for that reason, once you can get a state up and running, like the British state, they tend to just keep going. Corporations, you can create a corporation. We could decide in this room now to create a corporation, and we could have one probably in about 15 minutes on the company's house. If you want to do it, I'm up for it. You know, <laughs> uh, And we could decide that it exists to monetize this event and you know, see how we go. And then we all go bust, but luckily it's limited liability, and we all walk away. So <laughs> corporations... You can create them at the drop of a hat and they get destroyed at the drop of a hat. And I quote in there, there are 200 states in the world. I've forgotten the number now, but it's, it's hundreds of millions of corporations in the world, most of which don't last very long at all. So one of the features of states is that most, of, not all of them, but most of them live longer than human beings. One of the features of corporations is that almost all of them 
have a 5, 10, 15 year shelf life. So they are these much more here today, gone tomorrow entities. They are designed for particular purposes. Some of them are just shell companies, companies within companies. You know, anyone who tried to look at the flow chart of how Enron worked before it went bust. The corporations within corporations, I say in the book, it's a bit like our fear of robots that just start spewing out more robots, like endless, endless little pointless replicants of themselves until we're drowning in them. It sometimes feels like that in the world of corporations. But the most powerful ones are, in some ways, as or more powerful than states, some of them. The really big ones. Some of them are very long-lasting. Banks, some banks have been around for... 150 plus years. Some of the world's biggest car companies have been around for more than 100 years. But the current most powerful corporations in the world are the tech companies. They are vast. At various points, they have more money in their bank accounts than the American government does. They don't have an army, so they can't do that. They can't fight wars, but they can sustain enormous amounts of debt. And they're really young. 20 years ago, yeah, you know, 20 years ago, there was no Facebook or Meta or whatever it is. 30 years ago, there was no Google. Uh, 50 years ago, there was no Microsoft. I don't know how many years ago, there was no Tesla. These things are incredibly powerful, but they are also these artificial decision-making machines. And again, I think we have a tendency to humanize them. So we think, isn't Facebook just Mark Zuckerberg? Isn't Tesla just Elon Musk? And that is a category mistake. Elon Musk can't do this. Mark Zuckerberg can't do this. It is not a coincidence that when these men, almost all men, have one of these bright ideas, and then they really want to monetize it, they turn themselves and their idea into the corporate form. And then it has power and legs. So they're not the same as states. They have lots of different qualities. But they have superhuman powers. They're much easier to kill. Not least states can kill them. If the US government wanted to destroy Tesla tomorrow, it could pull the plug. It has that power within it. Not least it controls the currency that even Tesla depends on. When Facebook Meta said, we will have our own currency, Libra, I don't even remember that a couple of years ago, the US Treasury killed it like that. Made it completely clear to Mark Zuckerberg if he wanted to get out of bed the next morning, he wouldn't have his own currency. <laughs> so states still have these incredible powers. But these corporations have astonishing powers too. And these big tech companies are building the actual robots. So we need to think about these relationships, state to corporation to AI, in which we feed in in all sorts of different ways. But it's never going to just fall back on us to decide what we do or don't want. We've got to get better control over the different machines if we want them to control each other. But you do say we are going to have to decide where our loyalty lies, which we're going to have to decide which between states and AI. You, you say that. So at the end of the book, I say it does seem to me that there are some, some choices looming because there are people, the, the evangelists of AI, who think that basically this period of politics I describe in the book is over. So the fact that we live in a world dominated by and made by states and corporations doesn't mean that I think that this is the way it has to be. This was the way it was always bound to be. And this is the way it always will be. Right? This is 300 years in a human story I tell in this book, which is 100,000 years. But it is a very important 300 years, and it's the 300 years that changed everything about the planet that we live on and our, most of our lives within it. Very, 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 very few lives are untouched by the transformation of states and corporations. But there are people who think that period is over. The, the state is done. This clunking Leviathan is too analog, too human, you know, because you have to ask human beings what they think to get an answer to the question of what's going to happen. Too slow. Even certain kinds of corporations are too clunking. And these new machines, the AIs, the algorithms, they're going to give us a kind of hyper-efficient version of this where our lives can be organized without having to go through slow representative decision-making. And there is that temptation, and there are many people in Silicon Valley who think we're close to that, a complete transformation. My feeling is that we still have a choice, which is, do we think we can gain enough control over the other machines to allow them to reflect what it is that we want? So it might be, I have no idea, right? It might be that the Silicon Valley vision of the world would be paradise. I doubt it. 
but it's possible. I mean, anyth anything's possible. The sex bot revolution could be great, right? But I'm mean, just choosing that because it's the one you read out. This book is this book literally only uses the word sex bot once. Once I didn't talk about it at all. <laughs> so it's not that was sex, just the quote that explains. It's not the sex bot book. Um, let's call them the AIs. It might be that they do give us incredible. You know, the, the real boosters of this say we're going to live thanks to these new machines. We're, we're going to live for hundreds of years. You now we're suddenly these machines are going to work out how our bodies work, and they will be able to recalibrate our bodies so we don't need to get old or sick. When we die, we'll be able to upload our memories to the cloud so that we can maybe one day, we'll be able to live forever. We never need to be angry or cross or hungry or tired because they can calibrate everything for us. So, sounds dystopian, but maybe it's paradise. I have no idea. But in the meantime, if we want to input what we would like to happen into this world, I don't think we should do it through our Google searches. I think we should do it by remembering that there are still powerful machines that can control those machines. States can control corporations. Corporations can control the machines they build. And we need to input primarily into states what it is we would want to happen. And in the great discussion about you know, do we want Rishi Sunak or Keir Starmer to be our next human face of the impersonal British state, no one's talking about this. I mean, the next election is not going to turn on where and how we want the power of states to control both corporations and AIs in this coming future. It's going to turn on much more human questions. But while we're worrying about those much more human questions, the corporations are building more machines. Yes, because just before we get to maybe some of those, you've talked about climate a bit, which is a really interesting, um, and jobs, which are things that people think of when they think of perhaps what technology can do. But just to sort of work out that, that we do have agency in this. You say humans make states which can acquire a life of their own. Corporations make robots which do not have a life of their own yet. So what comes next depends on what states and corporations might do with the powers they have been given and what we might still be able to do to shape how they use them, which is what you're saying. So ultimately, we do have agency in this. Yeah, yeah we do. So this is a book about agency, human agency, artificial agency. These super agents have a kind of agency that we don't have, this capacity to do these kind of enormously consequential things, these long-term decisions, these sort of global decisions that affect all of us. But we still have agency individually and collectively. We can organize campaigns. We can take to the streets. You know, we, it's not, we're not powerless in this world. We have human agency. They have artificial agency. But their artificial agency is ultimately the thing that will control that future. So we need to use our human agency to recover what we may have lost by giving up too much to their agency. So one of the things, and one of the trade-offs, to go back to Hobbes, that he thought the modern world offered was, if you can build the state robot, get it right, design it well, have it live for 300 years, the great thing is it will free human beings from having to think about politics, because politics is boring and miserable, and we've got better things to do with our lives. You know, politics is just not a fun business, unless you're weird, right? <laughs> so he thought most human beings, given the choice, would rather do other things than politics. So if you can build a machine that just chugs along, takes decisions, keeps people relatively safe, calibrates the tax rate they can live with, makes sure that hospitals can function, you know, that kind of thing, some of the basic stuff, it would free us not to have to think about politics. But that is a Faustian bargain, right? Because if we don't think about politics, we've lost control of the machine. And while the machine is chugging along, it will start to do things that we don't like. And it will also allow other machines to start doing things that we don't like. I think part of this is an old fashioned argument for saying we, sh we still need to remember that if we want to regain control through our human agency, we've got to input more into the agency of these machines. And that means probably taking more interest in what they do, understanding a bit better how they work. And I did say at the beginning, one of the parallels here is that with AI, even the people who build it aren't sure how it works. That is absolutely true about states and corporations too. Or probably any organization. So I work for a university. It's a pretty tame sort of organization. I have no idea how it reaches the decisions that it reaches. I mean, it's just complete. And I suspect the people who design its decision-making procedures have no idea. This thing, this university does stuff, 
And everyone involved goes, what? <laughs> Even the people who were in the room when the decision was made, because some procedure was followed, and then at the end of it all, everyone thinks, how did we decide that? So times that by whatever with the British state. And I don't think prime ministers understand how the British state works. It's this vast, complicated machine. So it's hard work trying to work out where you can influence it and how you can influence it and so on. But there's a difference between that and just thinking, we'll let it just do its own thing. No, it's, it's the machine. We'll let it just keep ticking on like a giant clock. Tick, 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 tick. And we'll live our own lives. Because one day, it'll go wrong. And if we don't know how it works, then... That, that helps to that sort of answers I think the question I asked about why books like this help because the unpicking things that we we need to do and, and literature books and your subject of course helps do that but we are talking about states quite generally here I mean yeah. not all states no, are the same no, no no they're not and across history states have functioned on in many different ways so when I talk about the state I mean modern states so in the book I talk a bit about the difference between modern states and super powerful ancient entities like the Roman Empire or you know, things far more durable. It's impressive that the British state has been around for 300 plus years, but the Catholic Church is a hell of a lot more impressive than that. You know, it's a corporate entity, incredibly powerful, has been around for a lot longer, still going strong, still has many, many more members than any state in the world, including China and India. But it is not a robot, I don't think, because one of the features of modern states and modern corporations is that you can recreate the conditions for them to work, the mechanical conditions for them to work anywhere. So the, the Catholic Church is a unique institution. There isn't anything else like it, actually. The Roman Empire, no one's ever been able to replicate the Roman Empire. But modern states have been replicated all around the world in places that are completely different. So Denmark and South Korea, two very, very successful modern states that function in surprisingly similar ways, despite having different cultures, different systems, are able to sustain these burdens, build these security structures, improve the lives of their citizens, they live much longer, they're better educated, they're healthier, they have better lives, I think it's fair to say. That's what's different about the modern version of these things, that you can repeat it, these things are replicable, because they are mechanical. So the Catholic Church is actually not I think, just a machine, any more actually than the Roman Empire was a machine. It was a, it was a one-off, these things are one-off, remarkable, collective human experiments with some mechanical features. But you just can't reproduce them. But, and I'm not an advocate for saying what we should do is go out and build Western states all around the world, because it's often a disaster because it's harder than it looks. But the evidence of the last 100 years is that this form of politics and this form of economics is replicable. And so one of the examples I give in the book is China. So China has a very powerful modern state. Hasn't had it for long. But the Chinese state has been powerful in a modern form for quite a long time. But the Chinese state only empowered corporations to have a life of their own in the 1970s. And from the 1970s to now, the greatest wealth creation in human history has taken place in China, including bringing people out of poverty, uh, increasing life expectancy, literacy, all those measures of development. And it was done because it turns out that you can replicate this by creating these mechanical structures. The downside is always the downside. Is anyone still in control? Chinese states and Chinese corporations are terrifying things. They've done these remarkable things, but it's also a very, very, very frightening coming together of two kinds of mechanical, artificial power. So I think that's the difference. St you can, you, you can organise a political society in a million different ways, and human history is littered with these. Some of them have been great, some of them have been catastrophic. In some of them, from the ancient to the modern world, human beings have prospered. In some of them, they've suffered enormously. But this is the only one that has reproduced like it was mechanical reproduction, as though there were a blueprint that could just be plonked around the world. Because all of the other ones have worked where they've worked, and then when they stop working, that's it. These ones are the ones that keep going. That's why they're more like AIs than they are like human organisms.
I wanted to come to the positives, but listening to you say that, <laughs> it's slightly hard because the, the point is we therefore can do the things you were saying. We can have more agency. We can find out more about how our state works. But when you have China doing what it's doing or the US, it doesn't matter. Um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> I, so, so I don't think this isn't a story with lots of positives in it. I mean, what I just described, you know, the, the greatest experiment in taking human beings out of poverty in human history, which has happened in China. I think a lot of people in China would say this story of state and corporate power being let off the leash has been enormously positive for human beings. But yes, it is true that in a world of these super powerful entities, most human beings have no say in what they do. So yeah, we don't have any say in who's going to be the next president of the United States. And it's a scary, it's a scary one, that one. We have even less say in how these giant tech companies operate. Right? You know, even, so even Americans who have some say in who's the next president of the United States, depending which state they live in, because of the Electoral College, most of them don't have any impact on it at all. But they have almost no say in how these corporations run. And these corporations are set up to empower tiny numbers of people with extraordinary power. Mark Zuckerberg, I think the constitution of Facebook means that Mark Zuckerberg cannot be voted out. I mean, that there can't be a shareholder revolt against him because he controls the majority of the shares. So he's like an Egyptian pharaoh or something. <laughs> it is true that most human beings do not have input into the control of these machines. But some human beings do, and we can work out which of the human beings that do. So Mark Zuckerberg is not frightened of his shareholders, but I suspect he is still frightened of the American president. And so if that's the way in to control him, that's the way in to control him. Human beings can only do what they can, but even in a little humble country like this one now, um, after it's some of its recent decisions, um, made by us, sort of, um, there are many, many things that we can do. And so the example I gave this coming election, which is talking about things that are important to people, no question, but some of these long-term choices about how we're going to structure a world in which all sorts of entities will have decision-making power over us, and we want to retain some kind of control. The British state is still, for all its reduced circumstances, unbelievably powerful. Unbelievably powerful relative to any other states in human history. It can do things that would have seemed beyond the dreams of a Roman emperor. I mean, Roman emperors could kill people and they could you know, throw dinner parties and stuff like that. But the actual power dissipated so quickly as it spread out. These states can take decisions and make them stick. So we shouldn't give up. I mean, it's not like, I'm, not, I'm not saying basically the game is up and in the end you know, the machines are going to win. But it's a question of working out where we can exercise human agencies in ways that might make a difference. I think of the part where you talk about Elizabeth Warren having said that um, in the States. And you say something about she tried to take, take issue with the tech companies and it didn't work out. But conspiracy theories sometimes... <laughs> Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> a conspiracy theorist would say when Elizabeth Warren said she was going to take out big tech, big tech made sure that she wasn't going to be president. Sometimes conspiracy theorists are right. Um, I, it's time, I think, very shortly for questions from the audience. But I did want to ask about climate because you, you say, which I found really fascinating, we're not living through the Anthropocene, which we've been told we are. We're living through the Leviocene. Yeah. That's the sort of, to me, that was the less positive element of it. But there are ways in which technology and AI you see could be harnessed um, positively, you know, and t sort of take us off the path we're heading for environmental destruction. Yeah, so just to explain that, so the Anthropocene, which is the term that's come to be used for the period in geological history where the planet and its geology and, and indeed everything that it rises on top of that is shaped by the fact that the humans are the dominant species. And people date it from the Industrial Revolution, or some people date it from as recently as 1945 and nuclear weapons. But as it were, the fate of the planet now depends on us. That's the idea behind the Anthropocene. We're responsible for it. You, know, you, you, you broke it, you own it kind of thing. So an anth the Anthropo bit means the human. So this is the, the age where geology is shaped by the human. And I say it's the wrong name for it. We've been around for 100,000 years. And this has only happened in the last two to 300 years. It's not because of us. It's not because of our qualities. It's not because we changed our character and became greedier or 
more indifferent to the fate of the planet. I think most people aren't particularly greedy, and I think most people want to live in a sustainable world. It's states and corporations that did this. It's their power, it's their capacity that shaped this world. It's because of the power of states and corporations that the air has what it has in it, that the oceans have what they have in it. It's not actually us. So, for instance, I think, I can't remember the figures, but something like 70% of all carbon emissions are the responsibility of 100 corporations. Not of 7 billion people, but of 100 corporations. And so you'd think, well, what do we do to stop, what do we need to do to stop that? Get humans to behave differently? One, that's really hard, we never change. And two, there are too many of us. But also, we didn't do it. <laughs> It's those hundred corporations. If they're responsible for 70% of it, wouldn't the sensible thing be to make corporations behave differently? Which is actually easier, because states can change their constitutions. States can incentivize them in different ways. States can say, you are no longer simply in the business of profit maximization. You have to take account of the long-term natural capital costs of what you do in every single economic decision that you make. So, what I don't like about the idea of the Anthropocene, and I know I've discussed this with very people who just say it's tough, you know, it's a geological term and it's not about politics, but what I don't like about the idea of the Anthropocene is that it says humans did it, so humans have to change to make it better. And I think that's wrong. I think we didn't do it, the machines we built did it, so what we should do is change the machines. And that's why I say it should be called the Leviathan. It starts with the creation of the Leviathan and then the corporate versions of it. And it's their powers, the fact they don't actually care because they're not feeling creatures, that has done this. And so what do you do when the robots go wrong? You re-engineer them. You could try and re-engineer us by telling us, you know, we have to live completely different lives, we have to forego all sorts of pleasures, you know, we have to change how we incentivize ourselves in the world. And maybe we should, and we could all be better people. But that's really hard. Or, much easier, you recalibrate the machines. It's both, though, isn't it? Yeah, but we're focused way too much, I think, on the people need to be better. People need to take responsibility. I think people need to take responsibility for getting the machines to change. Because otherwise, we could all change. So we, you know, this is where the futility comes in, right? Everyone in Britain could adopt a really, really sustainable lifestyle. And over time, our state would adapt to that. But these corporate entities would just keep on keeping on, and the ones that we don't control would be indifferent to what we do. The alternative would be to think, we really need to think about the ways in which those entities can be made more responsible. And that, sustainability is great, but that won't happen because we become more sustainable. It'll happen because we change how they function. Didn't I say that you needed to have your heads <laughs> clear, that there was a lot to take on board? Um, I feel like, I, I think, knowing um, what the questions from the audience here are normally like, I'm going to pass over to you, and if I get the baton back, I'll, uh, I'll continue with mine. Uh, yes, we start. Uh, do you, you probably don't need... Um, oh, yeah, there's a mic coming. Um, thank you so much. So... Um, Kind of something I wanted to ask is going on. Well, I was originally going to ask about religion, and then I enjoy kind of the corporate of the Catholic um, Church. So thanks for touching on that. Um, but talking about something I think quite a lot about is the relationship that we've con that these machines, as you yeah. call them, we've constructed between innovation and regulation. Yeah. And in my opinion, it's quite linear, where. AI functionally is not, there's no moment of, with the atom bomb, it existed. And then it was up to regulators if they have yeah. regulated it. So I just, yeah. how kind of that all plays in. Yeah, so it's a great question. I mean, there is a, there seems to be a kind of division of labor here, which is the corporations do the innovation and the states do the regulation. And... In some areas, that can be quite effective. So pharmaceuticals is often given a, an example of this. You know, big, big pharma, which may be evil, I don't know, but would definitely like to roll out its medicines much quicker than the FDA will allow. And it really takes a long time to get a drug to market. You have to do a lot of testing, and there, you know, there are barriers built in the way of that. It's quite a tightly regulated area, maybe less so now than it used to be, but still pretty tightly regulated. And as many people have pointed out, 
tech is nothing like that, right? There's almost no regulation of things that are disastrous for our health, for instance, the addictive qualities of social media for young people in particular. You know, this thing, no question, I think you, you've got to be really starry-eyed to think that there haven't been consequences of the fact that these things are literally engineered to be addictive, right? To be scrollable, they, they, they work with our thumbs male thumbs on the whole, because they're too, you know, but they're designed to be addictive. They are, they are a drug. Well, we all know that, right? And it's pretty unregulated. So, so one issue here is that the state seems to have very different appetite for regulation in some areas than in others, and you know, to understand why that is, it, it involves lobbying and all sorts of things. But also, maybe that division of labor is wrong. And I write about this a bit in the book. States can be pretty innovative, particularly in wartime, and most of this technology comes out of state innovation, not corporate innovation. And well-run corporations can be pretty regulatory, but you've got to set them up right. So if you set them up without building into them the capacity to, to take a kind of artificial responsibility for what they do, they will likely sort of run away with it. So there is something, it seems to me, as, w as well as, like you say, being linear in the sense that as well, the innovation happens and then the state steps in. There's something really old-fashionedly schematic about this in a world where the big tech companies are so dynamic now, so experimental, so willing to try new stuff, roll it out to market and see if anyone dies. You know, that's, that's you know, see what happens. That's the motto of this. And I think... It's, it's almost like that division of labor feels a bit analog in a digital world. So there might be better ways of designing this where we get, on the one hand, more innovative states. For instance, you could innovate with constitutional architecture and corporations that are better able to regulate themselves. It's not impossible. Just because they're inhuman doesn't mean that they can't take certain kinds of responsibility. They do, in the end, pay their debts, most of them. So. But it's a great question because I just do think it is, yeah, it is too, it's almost too schematic and simplistic, that, that division of labour, especially now. Thank you. And by the way, if I check this, it's not because I'm addicted, it's because I'm checking the time because there isn't a clock and I need to make sure we finish in time. Um, yeah. Should we take two or three let's, Yeah, let's take um, one here and one here if you've got another mic. All right. Um, I think you can do a, a slightly annoying thing, which is, um, firstly, you said there are lots of inputs, ways in which we input into these things. It's going to sort of single out one of them and ask you about it. And the second is not fully formed question. I just wanted one of your, thought, your thoughts on it. <clears throat> so I read there was a Washington Post article last week on remote working and remote tasking and how you know, people in countries like the Philippines where they review images from generative AI and confirm is it an accurate replication of an apple or something like that. And then the conditions are pretty squalid, the pay is low and falling, there's no employment protections. Um, and this is a, in some ways this doesn't seem new, it seems like a structural relationship that's existed, there's historical precedent of it. But I think it gets to the point around um, place in the ownership, production, and consumption of these technologies, the way that feeds into political systems, the way that states and corporates interact. And I just wondered about your, your thoughts on that. Do you want to take two questions at once? Um, yes, th thank you both for a very interesting discussion. I, I just wonder about the analogy you draw between states, corporations, and AIs, and whether there is a fundamental difference between the latter AIs. Um, not just because of the pace of change, but because of the nature of change that comes about as a result of it. And in particular, the decreasing ability to distinguish falsehood from truth as a result of generative AI, or the source of AI products, whether they're human or AI generated. And flowing from that, the inability to use traditional structures such as politics, um, academia, the law, um, where they have been used, albeit imperfectly, in relation to states and corporations to control and limit their actions. There'll be a decreasing ability to do that, and therefore, to, to return to your initial remarks, where you were asked whether we es essentially are facing something very different and more daunting, um, isn't that actually the case because of the... Um, 
And I suppose one last element of this is the ability of bad actors to influence. Yeah. In the past, their ability, and they've obviously, obviously they've always been there, and Nick Leeson's role within Barings Bank is an example of where that can go wrong. But the replicability and the ease with which a bad actor can influence um, effects or results in AI, doesn't that also mark a step change or a, a sea change uh, as a result of which we ought to be viewing this differently to those previous examples that you've been discussing? Okay, those are two big questions. Um, so on the first one, I mean, it's, there are lots of things to say about that, and many of them I probably, I'm not qualified to say about the ways in which all sorts of what you might call familiar structural features, as you say, in this brave new world, you notice things that feel like they maybe come from the 19th century, and that is no question a feature of it. So I do have a chapter in the book about the future of work, and I'm not going to try and summarize it here, but I just want to say one thing about it, which is, as I said a bit earlier, you know, we tend to think about this as sort of the contest between us and the machines for the jobs. So I think that's wrong, and I think the history of innovation suggests that there will still be lots of jobs. It's the quality, the character of the jobs. And one of the things I think that we've already seen is that what this technology does is it reduces jobs to tasks. So the traditional job, which, if you're lucky, leads to something that used to be called a career. I don't think they exist anymore. But there used to be things called careers and careers advisors, you know, when people believed that you might do the same thing for 30 years. Careers and jobs are at the end where you do get the structural stability and security that comes with long-lasting corporate and political entities in the civil service or whatever. But this new technology tends to reduce all forms of activity to task-based enterprises because it's what it does well. So that's what this technology does well, is it's really good at tasks. It's crap at jobs, right? Because jobs are things where you have to have relationships with your co-workers and hope for promotion or whatever it is. So they're not, these machines don't do that. And so there is a danger, and this is one of the things I say in the book, that rather than these machines come to take the jobs, they turn jobs into task-based work. And task-based work, among other things, makes human beings much easier to exploit. But one of the great things about jobs is they come with benefits. Tasks don't. No one ever got benefits for doing a task. You just get your little hit of reward. So. And then on the other question, <laughs> um, I mean, I think I want to say that in the book, and I've sort of condensed it here, that I'm definitely not saying these things are just sort of analogous in that way. So part of the book, in my mind, the, the book has three kinds of arguments in it, one of which is about the parallels between these things, and there are parallels, I think, that we miss. One is about sequence, historical sequence, which is the states and corporations came first. They've been around for longer, but they also built the world that built these technologies. And then the third is about the politics of it, where some of the disanalogies really do leap out at you, one of which is speed, as you said. So one of the things about traditional states is they were designed to be slow. One of the reasons that America has the electoral system as it has is to stop madness taking hold of the population just by slowing everything down, making it cumbersome, because the thought was that human beings have a tendency to impulsive action. These are designed to feed off our impulses. And that does mean, as you say, that bad actors have a license that they wouldn't have under these traditional structures, including for disinformation. States have always been in the disinformation game, but there is a speed and, a, and an unregulated quality to this that makes it different. The only thing I would say is that I still believe, you know, in a world of all sorts of structures that shape how we live, decisions still depend on identifying the agent that is capable of taking the decision and making it stick. And if we want to get control of the bad actors, Mark Zuckerberg would say, leave it to me, I'll regulate Facebook and you know, I'll create a committee of people who will check that nothing too bad is happening. I think to trust that would be wishful. Or we have to rely on some of those traditional agents, the, the, the regulatory agents of, of the modern state. But if we're going to rely on them with any confidence, they've got to get up to speed. I mean, that's, that's the point. It is too slow now. It is too cumbersome. It is too analog. 
And we should demand that of them, which we don't. So one of the real risks here is that actually in this world of competing agents, some of whom really are bad, I mean, I don't think Mark Zuckerberg is bad, but he empowers bad people with his platforms, no question. In that kind of world, you know, whatever that saying is, you know, by the time truth has got its boots on, lies are halfway around the world. That's pre the digital age. Well, now, by the time truth has thought about getting its boots on, the lie's been around the world a billion times. In that world, we need the traditional agents just to be more up to speed, and they're not. But, or we could give up on them and think we need to find equivalently smart and quick tech to regulate smart and quick tech. But I'm pretty skeptical that that's gonna work, I have to say, because it just empowers the tech companies. I think the irony is then the truth in who actually made, said that has been lost, no one knows. Really? Was it Mark Twain? About the truth well, and the lies? Case, like, yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone knows, <laughs> if anyone could tell me exactly who it was. Um, well, we could Google it. <laughs> and you'll find the wrong person, that's what I can't, I can't remember. Um, yes, and that, who, is anyone else? Let's take a question um, from here, the gentleman in the pink shirt and um, here. So if we go for two, we can keep them maybe as yes, punchy um, as possible. Okay, I'm going back to your regulatory corporate. Um, actually, I'm at the Bank of England. We um, have actually gone through the process of requiring disclosures on climate, going back to the climate situation and going back to how regulation can actually drive corporates, banks, insurers to address the climate issue, okay? Of course, we see how that's going because there's a lot of now, and especially in the US, the politicization of an ESG or you know you're woke or whatever. So I guess when I'm thinking about your this discussion and the different agency, so you have a situation where regulation is trying to address and move the the dial forward, mm. but then you also have the pushback of the corporates themselves yeah. that are looking at shareholder value, stranded assets, yeah. the Minsky moment. So how does that work in your analysis or theory, because there is, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, as you said, Hobbes is rather dour, and Hobbes and a range of other actors did what they did in the 1670s and 80s because the quarter of Europe killed each other yeah. through religious wars. Yeah. What gives you hope that we can make these changes? What symptoms do you see without killing each other? What are those, your positives? Those are, those are two very different kinds of questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, right, should I... So, I mean, so one of the things I want to say in response to what you say, I don't think you know, the, the, the ESG question, all of that, and corporate pushback, and, and a lot of it does have to do with some of the, what I think most people think of as less sexy side of government, which is regulation. But th there is also a tendency, it goes back to the question I was asked earlier about the, the way in which we humanize the state by focusing on leaders. It's an incredible, I mean, I'm astonished by how much political coverage is about elections. Because elections are important, but they're not the most important thing, to be honest. Um, they don't change that much. Just swapping out the people at the top doesn't make a huge difference. Most of the work of the machinery of state is done by the machinery of state, in which other kinds of leadership can matter more away from the public gaze. Now, these vast machines, including the Bank of England, you know, an early corporate example, um, Modern states are remarkably varied and complex bureaucratic organizations, and bureaucracy is the biggest part of the state. I don't mean that in a negative sense, it's just, you know, as it were, that that's, that's the function of the state, to keep the machinery going. And a lot of our focus on, if we could just get rid of those bastards and replace them with these bastards, <laughs> misses out where the action is. But of course, people don't tend to think of it as action because if people aren't that interested in politics, they're definitely not interested in corporate and banking regulatory politics. But it sort of touches on what I was saying earlier, that we should be, because that's where the control comes from. It is that part of the state that can control the things that are like it. The Bank of England can control other entities that aren't a million miles away from the Bank of England. But if we allow our focus on the frothy stuff at the top to dominate, we might miss all of the ways in which we are not doing what we could to, to push back. I don't know if that answers the question. 
And then how are we going to stop? How are we going to stop us? I mean, that's, so yes, it's true. It, it, you know, the, the Leviathan is a response to the not less, I think, to the English Civil War than to the Thirty Years' War, the worst war in human history to that point, but not the worst war in human history. In terms of, I mean, actually, I think to live through it, it's hard to imagine anything worse. But still, unbelievably grim. And Hobbes, who I think was an optimist, not a pessimist, because he said, if we set this machinery up right, that will never happen again. And in a way, he was right. That didn't happen again. What happened again were the 20th century wars, which weren't like the 30 years war, which was kind of low level, everyone killing everyone, as he called it, the war of all against all. The 20th century wars that ended up killing more people are in the service of these vast mechanical enterprises, which have a life of their own and which now have nuclear weapons. So my, part of my answer to that question would be, and the book ends with a discussion of the, the big existential risks. And I think I'm one of those people, there are usually thought to be four at the moment. The killer robots coming to eat us. Uh, Bioengineering, as it's sometimes called, bioterror or error, the, the, the interference with the, the human biology by bad actors. Catastrophic climate change and nuclear weapons. So A, those are all in the hands of states and corporations. So if, if any of those kill us all, it will be because states and corporations did it. But B, I think that we ha we, we've slightly downplayed the nuclear threat. These states are still armed. They still have these things. These states are still inhuman. They have these devices. So I was talking to someone today, earlier today, who was involved in some high-level discussions. I can't say who it was. Uh, about AI systems in the South China Sea and the question of whether or not those systems should be insulated, defense systems, from human input. Because the trouble with human beings is they're a bit soft. And the most powerful, it's, it's mutually assured destruction, right? The most powerful deterrent is the machine that you know that a human being can't switch off. And the person who told me about it said that they were properly terrified by those discussions because of the increasing view that this technology is so smart now, you can't risk human input to slow it down. Now, the only reason we're all here now is because during the Cold War, human beings put grit into the machinery of the state. Or the states would have killed us. They would have killed us. They had those weapons and they were willing to do it, but human beings stopped it. So I think the danger is not that we're going to all kill each other, because I don't think we want to kill each other, but that we've created decision-making entities that have the capacity to do that, and we may have lost control of them. And their name is not AIs and killer robots. Their name is states and corporations, but in the case of nuclear weapons, unless you know, Elon Musk has got a little nuke tucked away in his back garden. In the case of nuclear weapons, it's states. Okay, yes, let's take uh, two, two more. Um, where the mic? Someone got a mic already, they can pass over. You've got one already with the question. Oh, question. Answer the question, and then this. Okay, in the cap. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, given what you said about the need for the state to get up to speed, yeah. um, do you have any sympathy for Dominic Cummings? Yeah, I do. Oh, he gets a good. He gets a very interesting <laughs> mention. So there's a little Cummings section. Anyway. <laughs> I mean, sympathy is a strong word <laughs> uh, because uh, you know there's ups and downs. Um, but I do write not about. Brexit or any of that, but um, I do write about Dominic Cummings' writings on his blog, which remains really fascinating reading, I think. And, and one of his um, causes that he's been involved in for a long time now, and he tried when he was in government to do it, and he failed because, the, as he would call it, the blob or the machinery of the state defeated him, was to try and turn the, the mechanics of the state, the machinery of state, into something more like a startup. Now, I say in the book, I think that's a category mistake because I just don't think states can function like startups. Because the point about states, you know, Cummings says the state should adopt Jeff Bezos's mantra, which is every day is day one. Well, no. In the case of the British state, today is year 300. You know, if you think it's day one, there's a huge weight of legacy and history and obligation, including debts that were accumulated in the Napoleonic Wars. So if you think it's day one, but, so I don't have sympathy with that, but I do have sympathy with his notion that we are often worrying about the wrong thing. So he is, having been 
burned by the experience, absolutely adamant we spend too much time swapping out the idiots, including the one he put in and then tried to swap out. You probably know that the day after Johnson won in 2019, Cummings was fermenting his coup to get rid of him. When what we should be focusing on is the machinery of state. But the machinery of state for it to work well requires really smart people to redesign it and to get it up to speed. So he's not someone who kind of thinks what we should do is just sort of give the AIs the opportunity to recalibrate the British state. He says it's people, ideas, machines in that order, borrowing from the guy who was responsible for the Manhattan Project. People still matter, but he does think, and I think he's right, that the mechanics of politics, the machinery of state, doesn't get enough attention because people, voters, spend too much time thinking about changing the people. You know, he, he put out that famous advert where he said he wants blah, blah, blah and weirdos to come in and re-engineer the British state. I mean, he's sort of, he's also discredited the entire cause he believes in by his own political actions, but that doesn't mean he's wrong. Don't He's have one more, I think that's, yeah. Passing on from, from that legacy question, do you think the length of the state, which you talk about a lot, the length of the state has a relationship to whether it can actually change its machinery? Well, how long so, it's been around, yeah. Yeah, so think, thinking through like electoral reform, which is obviously kind of the machinery that you're talking about. I know yeah. you're into electoral reform as a big fan. Yeah. Um, younger countries tend to be more proportional. Yeah. Israel, West Germany, now Germany. Um, these have much more proportional systems than the US, uh, Britain. It, it, do you have any hope for electoral reform, given how long the British state has kept this kind yeah. of system yeah, yeah, going? Yeah. yeah, that's a great question, and I think it is true. You know, there are lots of different kinds of states. There are definitely more innovative states. I don't know whether it has necessarily to do with longevity itself. Um, I think it's often a whole host of factors. I mean, for instance, now, I would say that the Irish state is a more innovative state than the British state, um, for a whole range of reasons. I think smaller states can be more innovative than larger states, but also some you know, new states also really struggle, like Somalia and now, um, I'm sorry, Sudan and now Southern Sudan, South Sudan, new states, it's, it's nightmarishly hard to, to get them going. And it really depends on what conditions you, you try and get them going. There is the luxury of making reforms where the stakes aren't too high I mean, one of the reasons that the Irish state has been more innovative is the stakes are relatively lower than they were even 30 years ago. So it's a whole host of things, but you're, I mean, you're right. And I think it is, it is really striking how hard long-lived states find it to reform themselves. So for the Electoral College, read the House of Lords. You know, the British state has been talking about <laughs> doing something for 100 years. I don't think there's probably anyone alive who has outlived the conversation about <laughs> doing something about the House of Lords and it doesn't happen and there are a whole host of reasons but I think one of the reasons it doesn't happen is the time is never right because there are always more important things to do under the pressures of electoral politics. There's no way that Keir Starmer I don't think is going to expend his political capital. I don't think, I may be wrong, I don't know, but I don't think he will expend it on constitutional reform because he'll think he has more important things to do. And under those conditions, the reform never comes. Now, why it does come in some places, New Zealand is quite an innovative state too. Why it does come in some places, not in others, I don't know, but scale has to do with it. Longevity has something to do with it, and I think luck has something to do with it. I mean, I think the bleakest lesson from human history, if we want to end on a positive note. <laughs> the bleakest lesson from human history is that the great engine of progressive innovation is war. Uh, you know, the, the, the First World War and the Second World War and earlier wars create the conditions in which people will try new things, when ordinary people need to be rewarded for their sacrifices, when the stakes got so high that people stopped worrying that we might mess it up if we tinker with it. And out of that you get democracy and then social democracy and then welfare social democracy and you get the reforms that make us healthier, longer lived, better educated people. The great challenge is to do it in the absence of war. Well, I think that is, yeah, that is a positive in its way. Um, thank you for your brilliant questions, which have provoked hundreds more questions that we don't have time to ask, many of which are, of course, answered in the book. Um, and thank you, David, very, very much. Just a fascinating book and conversation. Thank well, th you. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you.